you'll hear the the mysterious voice. Um, so yeah, this is uh, a chance to get back together, as um, Teresa was saying in, in the in the comments. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of colleagues have been involved in uh, this series for a little while now. We've been running them for four or five years, um, and I'm going to hand over in a moment to to Professor Chris Winch, who's been uh, leading the leading the debate over that time. But I just wanted to start with some reflections about um, how this kind of theme has grown of late, uh, because I think we when we started these, Chris, we were thinking this would be really interesting, maybe slightly niche. We would have some lovely colleagues around the table, but actually it's it's kind of been picked up really widely, particularly by policymakers, as something that's really important. Uh, and so I wanted to thank everyone around the virtual table for everything you've done to make that happen, but also uh, to kind of reinforce that there's some really important kind of impact uh, work going on here. So um, we recently ran some great sessions with Skills Development Scotland, um, looking at many of these kind of broad cross-cutting issues um, and bringing those into kind of policy making. Um, our colleagues at IFATE, um, some of whom will, will be joining us, um, are running their big conversation, which again kind of steps back, looks at some of these kind of principal questions uh, in a really positive way. Um, I did a, a learning session with colleagues back at DFE, which was a bit intimidating for me because I hadn't seen some of them for six years yesterday. Um, and I was talking about the kind of different lenses that we might apply to, to improve policy making. And uh, one of those was uh, our other favorite of policy history, but one of them was, was the kind of philosophical lens and, and not being afraid to take that moment to step back and think about the, the broader context before you dive in with the next ministerial request, as I remember having to do myself. Um, and we've also developed a really strong partnership. And it's lovely to see Vicky here with colleagues at ETF, who I know are really interested in this theme um, as well. And it's lovely to have colleagues from ETF at each of these sessions too. Um, we've also uh, got a book potentially in the works and Ben is uh, leading that work with Chris. So um, all of the reports and I'll pop a link in the chat uh, that we've produced so far from the kind of four previous series um, and everything that we're doing through this series is also being developed into into that so i just wanted to start with that kind of positive perspective really that actually these debates have have developed into something that's really informing policy debate and that has the potential i think to, to go even further so yes thank you for everything so far and today will be another contribution to, to that kind of discussion so without further ado i'm gonna um hand over to chris just to introduce a bit about the, the previous discussions and, and the topic for today chris over to you thank you very much ollie Yes, uh, about five years ago, I think it is, or four or five years ago, um, Ollie was keen on de developing debates on, on, on the principles of vocational education in, in this country, um, mainly looking at, at epistemological questions and value questions. And we started that series in 2018. And we started also by looking at some of the, the, the big issues, if you like, the broad issues, such as the aims of vocational education, what's the nature of the curriculum, uh, who is it directed at, and so on. And over the years, we've we've brought the focus in a little bit more closely on, on specific topics. And interestingly enough, although these value and epist epistemological questions are, are quite clear at the large scale, they're still there at the, at the more detailed scale. So when we were looking at work-based learning, at assessments, at the, the notion of a common vocabulary for VET uh, and social partnership, these value and knowledge questions keep coming up. And now we're looking at something quite specific, uh, but again, I suspect this, this will be the case. There, there will be the, a need for conceptual clarification as well as exploration of the, of the complexities of the, the British uh, apprenticeship system. So I'm, I'm very much looking <coughs> forward to this debate. Um, can I just check, Ollie, that we've got the, the order, right, that Alison is leading for That's us? That's right. Yes, yeah. I think Alison's going to go first. So, so without yeah. further ado, Alison, um, I'll hand over to you. Oh, for some reason we can't hear you, Alison. I know you've just come off mute, but it's still we're still not getting audio from you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we got yeah. you. Wonderful. Must have been a, a lag. I promise you that I'm not um, phoning in from the Caribbean. I'm actually in East London, so <laughs> um, I'm not sure why that was. Anyway, hello everybody. Um, really nice to be here, and thanks to Ollie and Chris for inviting me. Um, and of course, hello to some. Some, some well known uh, old friends uh, in the audience and also anyone that I haven't met and so on. Really good to, to meet you. Um, Chris and Ollie asked me to kick off um, with, with my provocation, um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing the other panel members and also very much to the discussion because it's so nice to have 
you know, a good period of time that's been allocated to the seminar. So I'm really hopeful that we'll get a good debate going. So just to kick off and to dive straight in, we were asked about um, as contributors what we mean by apprenticeship. So I thought I'd dive in and just say what it is for me. Uh, so for me, it's apprenticeships first and foremost a model of substantial learning for occupational expertise, um, occupational identity, uh, skilled jobs, with transparent outcomes and what we might term might term exchange value. For example, professional recognition and higher wages, um, and then perhaps more broadly, um, also enabling um, a transition to uh, what we might think of as independent adulthood. So somebody who would effectively be uh, economically independent um, and therefore able to contribute, you know, as a as a full citizen. So then to move on to the the background information for the the event, I'm always quite a literal person. Um, I was really interested to, to, to look at the, the paragraph and um, it came in, in two main parts for me. The first that, that jumped out to me was the statement, apprentices are both novices, novice employees and learners. Um, and the second was about the employer's sort of challenge in delivering apprenticeship. And I wanted to sort of touch on both those. But the, the first one, um, uh, you know, stating that apprentices are both novice employees and, and learners, I think that kind of, fits with um, what underpins my um, definition or meaning of, of, of apprenticeship, you know, as, as a model of learning and um, taking somebody on that significant learning journey to, um, to full occupational expertise. But I think in the, the mind of the public, when they're thinking about apprenticeship, that the, the statement would call to mind um, the traditional picture of an apprentice as a young person, probably in their upper teens, um, probably fresh out of school or college, um, someone without tertiary education, um, and little, if any, experience of employment. But when we look at who apprentices are in the government supported programme uh, in England, um, we need to ask whether they are actually both novice uh, employees and learners. And the official statistics can help us here. Um, they show that um, uh, the public perception of employees as uh, you know, novices uh, fitting that description is actually rather misplaced. So I just want to briefly uh, illuminate that. Um, firstly, in terms of age, so a little bit of history. Prior to 2005, uh, the government supported apprenticeship program was um, restricted to those uh, aged between 16 and 24. But since then, it's become um, an all, all age program with those aged 25 plus uh, eligible to start apprenticeships. And most of the growth in the program has indeed related to starts in that older age group. So looking at the most recent year of statistics, which have just been released actually a couple of weeks ago for full year 21-22, um, only 22% of starts in the most recent year were under 19, whereas nearly 50% were aged 25 plus. And looking at the numbers uh, over the past 20 years or so reveals that on average approximately 100,000 young people under 19s we're starting an apprenticeship each year. Uh, and that, that amounts to approximately 6% of the total 16 to 18, 18 age groups. So it's small and hasn't grown really in terms of that um, traditional uh, age group. So despite the various changes in policy and funding, there have been ups and downs in the overall numbers. Um, we reached its high point, I think, in round about 11-12, 2011 12 um, uh, just peaking at over 500,000 starts, um, it's now down to 370 odd thousand, if I remember rightly. Um, but it's gone up and down over the years, but the percentage of starts has stayed under 19 has stayed stubbornly similar um, at around 20 to 25% of all starts. So the second point about the, you know, kind of querying the, the new, the, the novices as employees and learners point is the issue of what, what we call conversions, where existing employees are converted into apprentices. So this is very different to the received idea of apprentices being newly hired uh, novices. The, the stats provide data on the length of time someone has been employed by the same employer with whom they start an apprenticeship. So the current and past annual figures show the majority of people starting an apprenticeship have been employed for over three months before commencing their program and over a third have been employed for more than 12 months. And if we look at the 
starts in the 20 plus, 25 plus age group, we see that approximately three quarters have been with their employer for more than three months and nearly 60% for more than 12 months. So those starting an apprenticeship after a lengthy period of employment with their, their apprenticeship employer can't really be considered to be novice employees. Also requiring us to question the extent to which apprentices in this category are all given access to substantial new learning um, and substantial opportunities to gain that new occupational expertise. Um, or whether there is a lack of or limited additionality in these apprenticeships and be, for these apprentices. So the issue highlights the need for further debate about the pros and cons of using apprenticeship programme and apprenticeship levy for reskilling and upskilling the adult workforce. And I'm sure we're going to have the chance to, to debate that uh, during the course of the seminar. The third point I want to note um, really uh, in this first part is in relation to the growth in apprenticeships mainly being at the higher level. So higher level apprenticeships at a level four plus um, and particularly at degree and postgraduate levels have been the kind of sort of standout areas of growth uh, in recent years um, and particularly since the levy was introduced in, in um, 2017. So the division of uh, the division of the apprenticeship into all these different levels um, does mean that you can have somebody who's starting, let's say, a higher apprenticeship who may have already completed an intermediate and an advanced apprenticeship. Um, and therefore, that does question, again, the extent to which they're a novice uh, learner or a novice employee. Um, and those starting a degree apprenticeship um, in the main will have um, uh, you know, as we, as you as you'd expect, they will have gained significant formal qualifications before that. So, uh, you know, whether it's A levels or other formal qualifications, including BTECs. Um, so, there may be novice learners when it comes to an occupation link to their degree apprenticeship, but they aren't novice learners in a kind of true sense. You know, they they've got a track record of being um, successful learners. And those starting high apprenticeships, let's say, in leadership and management, which is the you know one of the the, the highest um, start uh, standards, um, they they are more likely to be existing, often long-standing employees with considerable skills uh, linked to their employment and work experience. So again, so I just wanted to really unpack that point. So we've got the kind of model of learning very much linked to the idea of novice employees and learners, but then we've got the reality of the government supported program, which I think will probably be the main focus of what we're talking about today, where we don't really see that um, being dominant. So the second part, um, and, and Ollie, please tell me how long I've got to go. A couple, I, I couple of minutes, Alison. That's fine. So this is a, a, a shorter part. Um, I agree with the statement in the background information for the seminar. I think employees do face a challenge um, and that's outlined in that paragraph. Um, I think we need to recognise that providing uh, high quality apprenticeships isn't easy um, and it's a challenge faced in all countries, not, not just England, uh, even, you know, dare I say it, in Germany. We also know that we have some brilliant apprenticeships um, and they're often found with um, employers who have long standing um, and substantial experience and expertise in providing apprenticeships and actually have quite a lot of infrastructure and capacity in that domain um, and they're in in organizations where the training of apprentices is seen as absolutely critical to the fulfillment of business goals our our research and the very major research i've undertaken with lorna unwin does indicate that most employers need assistance in uh, in their provision um, and there are various ways of helping them but first we might talk about the 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 need to foster the development of partnership um, and co-production approaches where providers and employers can work together um, uh, on that with different uh, areas of expertise, bringing together the, the kind of deep understanding of the skills needs uh, in the workplace um, and deep understanding of the kind of pedagogical elements that are needed in order to ensure that people are, are effectively trained. And a partnership between providers and employers is often the way to do that. And I can provide a chapter that Lorna and I have published recently on that issue of capacity, where we've argued that improving workplace capacity is a prerequisite for effective work-based learning or, or apprenticeships. Um, 
And a key part of that is focusing on the trainers and the teachers themselves and thinking about what kind of training they have. And it's great to hear that ETF are here, because I'm sure they'll be able to offer some very important insights into that in terms of their um, uh, focus on that area. And then the, the third point I'd say is it's important to think that there are some tools out there that can help. And, um, you know, without kind of blowing my own trumpet, um, one such is the expansive restrictive framework which Lorna and I have developed, um, you know, over the years, and which we have found um, employers and providers finding useful in helping them to self-evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of their provision in terms of its characteristics, both pedagogical and organiz organisational, and analysing um, in terms of those characteristics does provide insights into what might be changed, what it might be possible to change in order to help provision move to more towards the expansive end of the uh, the, the, the continuum. And finally, regulation. I think regulation of apprenticeship is quite weak, a regulation and inspection. Um, and I think that does contribute to the massive variation in practice that we have. Um, so we have some very clear principles and kind of rules of engagement for apprenticeships, but translating that into practice seems to allow for a huge amount of variation uh, to occur. Um, with, you know, lots of expansive, lots of perhaps restrictive, but in the main, a lot of default in the middle that could be better. Um, and things like the lack of curriculum, the uh, sort of looseness of what counts as off the job and on the job training, the looseness around what counts as a qualification are things which could be addressed, I think, to help put more of a floor under the quality um, and which uh, hopefully we'll have the chance to uh, debate as we go go forward and um, recently there's been a, a report by uh, Tom Richmond and colleagues from EDSK who's have come up I think with some some sensible and thoughtful um, recommendations in, relate to, in relation to the kind of training and curriculum aspects. So I'll stop there um, and look forward to uh, participating in the conversation over the next hour or so. Thank you very much indeed Alison, that was great. Uh, we'll now move straight on to Michaela Brockman from Southampton University. Over to you, Michaela. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Just uh, trying to work the technology here. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chris. And I also would like to say um, thanks to to Ollie and, and and Chris for inviting me to this event. And uh, yeah, hello to everybody. Um, and thank you for coming along. Um, yes, so um, I focus on the question how we can support. So the, the thing that struck me from the brief that we got was um, this idea of how we can support employers. Um, to provide more you know, better quality apprenticeships or to provide apprenticeships. And uh, my contention is that the question how we can support employ employers may in some respects be misplaced. So what's the evidence? Well, um, Alison just mentioned um, research, but in general, what's the evidence that organisations would provide quality apprenticeships if only they had more support? And I would argue that depends on how we define what a quality apprenticeship is. So um, obviously I'm drawing on my research, in particular, the uh, my latest uh, piece of research, which was funded by the Gutsby Foundation, uh, which looked at on the job training provided by different by employers across different sectors. And I also worked together with a colleague, Rob, Professor Rob Smith at um, Birmingham City University, who looked at the off the job element. And what we found in that research um, is, are massive differences in, in understanding of what an apprenticeship is, or, or indeed of awareness of what an apprenticeship should be. But what they all had in common, certainly amongst the employers, that they ran the apprenticeship in exactly the way that suited their, their business needs. So they, they didn't feel that they needed any support. And uh, so the main finding was that the quality of on and off the job training is reliant on the nature of the partnership between stakeholders and particularly between the employer and training provider. 
And that partnership is, of course, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's underpinned by the English education policy context and um, the, the market driven approach, really. So in terms of uh, policy and regulations and in, you know, again, um, Alison um, touched on this. Um, the rhetoric is, of course, that apprenticeship should include comprehensive on and off the job training, um, of course, with the active involvement of the employer, particularly when it comes to running the on the job training. So that's in all the, the regulations and the IFET um, policy statement and so on. In practice, we know, of course, that only the off the job element is regulated and only the off the job element is funded. So that now refers to this 20% 20, 20 rule that 20% of an apprentice's working time must be spent in off the job um, training. And that, of course, that also means that training providers are actually shouldering the main administrative burden. And then, so you have the policy on, on the one side, on the other hand, part of it, of course, you have a market of training providers whose income depends on recruiting employers who are happy, many of them are happy to tailor the apprenticeship to the employer's needs and whose sales pitch might include, we can do everything for you and you won't have an impact on productivity, which is most employers' um, concern is with productivity. So we can run the apprenticeship for you and you won't feel a thing, so to speak, um, to put it crudely. So we, we identified um, three different approaches or three different types of um, partnership. Um, the first one is developing apprentices to become experts in an industry-wide community of practice. So that's is very much along the lines of Alison and, and, and um, Lorna's expansive um, apprenticeship. And then we found um, two other type. One is apprenticeship as staff development, which I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail in a second. And then the third one is the performative type of apprenticeship that we we're also all aware of is um, an, uh, an apprenticeship that where, you know, based on a quite an exploitative relationship with with apprentices um so there's yeah very lower end lower quality of, of of apprenticeship i think we can all agree so let me just focus on this on the middle uh, which in my case so i found it particularly with uh, the retail and social care apprenticeships in in our study is where the responsibility for apprenticeship rests entirely with a training provider yeah, so the employers themselves had very little involvement overall, and there was little or no workplace training for apprentices for various reasons. And the employer role was really limited to, to, to kind of line managing the apprentices, you know, check on them whether they're okay, do they have all the support, do you have time to for your off the job element, um, and so on. And most remarkably, and even this, you know, I, I sort of knew about this, but it, this was so striking that the apprenticeship in these sectors, retail and social care, the apprenticeship was understood to, to refer only to the off the job component and quite separate from the day job. And that, of course, the, the off the job component, as we said, was the sole responsibility of the training provider. So if I can just... Um, site um, from a couple of interviews. One was the store manager of a national retailer who said, both of my guys work four days a week and the other day it's purely about their apprentice work. Okay, and then the home care manager, um, home care provider, sorry, manager said, we agreed to spend so much time on the apprenticeship and we tend to do it on a weekly basis. And the fact that they said it, in that way, and that this so basically they were doing their apprenticeship. The apprentices were doing their apprenticeship on a Friday, let's say. Um, but they said it as if there was nothing wrong with that. You know that that was perfectly fine as as far as they they were concerned. And in fact, they they thought of themselves as supportive employers when it came to apprenticeship. So, so yeah. So a lot of this, um, again, aligns with Alison's and, and, and Anwin's uh, restrictive framework. So the apprentices were first, first and foremost regular workers. They were not seen as learners. But 
these organizations were clearly investing in their workforce. So, so they used the, the apprenticeship um, programs as a staff of as, as a form of staff development, even though that had little to do with you know expansive apprenticeships or quality apprenticeships. So they put people on apprenticeships that they wanted to take a leadership role of some kind, for example. And then they used the off-the-job element um, to provide the apprentice with a wider occupational knowledge that the managers thought would equip them for, for such role. Okay, so another strong theme was the onus for completing the apprenticeship was firmly with the apprentice. And always this, you know, when we asked them about on-the-job learning, it was always, um, yeah, no, on the job learning, they absolutely do that, but it's totally, it's their responsibility. They have to uh, put into practice what they've learned in, in the on, in the off the job element. So even though almost in the same breath, they acknowledge that there was actually little time to, to do that. Um, so even by their own acknowledgement, they, yeah, it, it was in practice, it was very difficult. So to conclude, um, so what is remarkable is that these employers positioned themselves as highly supportive. They thought they were providing good apprenticeships and the apprentices for their part were also happy. They were happy about this opportunity that, um, you know, how supportive their managers were. They actually said that. So, and then when we presented um, our findings um, to the DfE, you know, that there was a sense that suggestions to strengthen regulations um, would tend to be dismissed. And, you know, there was also then reference to the apprenticeship survey pointing out that apprentices were by and large satisfied with the provision. Yes, so were our apprentices. They were all happy with, with, with the apprenticeship. But then the problem is perhaps, you know, they also are not aware of what an apprenticeship should, should, should look like. I think that that is the issue. So, but of course, the DfV have a have a point, you know, because if it wasn't for the flexibility and regulations, then many employers, including many large ones in the service sector, simply would not provide apprenticeships. So, from their point of view, from the DfV's point of view, shielding them from regulation is a form of incentivization. And that's the end of my provocation. Thank you. That was great, Michaela. Really fascinating and uh, material for ample discussion, I think. Mm. I'll now move on to James Norris from Was Also College. Um, over to you, James. Uh, th thanks, Chris. Um, I've, got, I've got everything sort of squared off in my head before the last two commentators that have put forward their, their points of view. And now I find myself completely ripping up the page and wanting to start again, really. Um, just for introduction, I'm James Norris. I'm uh, Vice Principal at Walsall College. Um, I'm also a board member of uh, the Association of Employment and Learning Providers, and also have sat on a number of different policy groups, including with colleagues such as Teresa on uh, apprenticeship policy groups for the AOC. And um, I've been in the sector now for uh, 14 years, um, largely um, responsible for managing apprenticeship provision and um, 11 years of that spent at, at Warsaw College. Um, and to say that we've been on a journey with regards to apprenticeships and work-based learning within the sector, I think is an understatement. And um, I'm just gonna probably just reflect a little bit for the purposes of this discussion, obviously on the topic, but also uh, our journey and some of the key challenges that might sort of uh, prompt some discussion underpinned by some of the theory and some of the data that both Alison and, and uh, Michaela, Michaela have presented. I guess um, when, when I came into the sector, um, we, I came into the sector in around about 2005 and um, apprenticeships were a fairly small part of our provision as a provider because we were all focused on trying to gain. Um, that was where that's what we were doing, and we were upskilling lots of adults in the employment. Uh, I'd like to say, as a college at that time, we were doing that particularly well and responsibly. Um, but we know there was others that weren't, and we're using it as a cash cow to drive numbers and NVQ and accrediting existing skills. Um, what we found was that at the time, our apprenticeship provision in my view, and that definition of apprentices is first and foremost is a job 
uh, with learning and training to support that individual to get to the next steps on the ladder of either progression into other levels of higher and further education, or indeed to progress to being a more productive employee and to learn those skills. And, and when we first got involved in apprentices, it was all about young people. It was all about encouraging social mobility. It was all about engaging with those that tended to be school leavers, that uh, wanted the opportunity to earn whilst they learned. And to be fair, at Walsall College, we've stuck by that principle, um, despite all of the different policy changes, papers, pieces of research. For us, it's about supporting our, our young people and adults to access jobs and employment, whereby then we can support through a training and development proposition in order to develop them whilst in, whilst in work. And I know that's really simple, but that's, that's the mantra that we've always stuck with here. We, I think, are still um, struggling to, through some of the nuances of the reforms from 2017 um, on a number of fronts, really. And I remember, I think I relayed this conversation at the time to Theresa, we were very fortunate that we had Justin Green in that came and sat in this building two weeks into the job as Secretary of State at the time. Um, we'll have a quiz in a minute of how many more we've had since then. But nevertheless, uh, so think about that whilst we're going through this. Um, so Justine came and I remember she sat in the boardroom just across the corridor from where I'm sitting. And um, I decided and thought, well, I've got nothing ventured, nothing gained. I was losing years with regard to trying to put into effect um, the proposals and changes for not only the transition to standards, but also the transition to the new funding regime. And... Um, Theresa and I know very well from the conversations we were having with various policymakers at the time, it put massive, massive pressure on providers, no doubt about it. And by the way, it didn't come with a dowry like T levels. It didn't come with any additional support uh, to, to transact what was the biggest reforms that we've been through a while. And Justin Green turned to me after I'd had my bit of a moan and she said, right, well, put yourself in my position. What would you do if you were Home Secretary for a day? I thought, well, this is a bit of an uplift. Do I get a knighthood at the end of this conversation? Probably not. But nevertheless, what I said to her is, please don't do both things at once. Please don't do funding reforms and qualification reform. You will take the legs of the sector. You will disrupt the employer market and you will give a lack of confidence to new younger apprentices coming to the system if we put too much turbulence into the market. As we all know, they didn't do that. They went ahead with both. And I think what we're still playing through now are some of the things that the um, EDSK research has just prompted, um, some of the St. Martin's group analysis about withdrawals has prompted. This is all washout now of those 2017 reforms really coming home to roost. And whatever we debate today, we have lots of really good employers that work with us and have worked with us both through what was frameworks now through to standards that are very passionate about apprenticeships. A lot of our employers, particularly in certain sectors, have done apprentices from over a number of years and still want it to look like a 1950s, 1960s apprenticeship program over multiple years with linear progression points to get somebody to be occupationally competent at the end of their program. And they're struggling with this agenda now. Um, and then we've got others that enter the market, other employers that enter the market with all the best intentions at the very beginning, but then find themselves after six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, really, have we really got to do all of this? What's this 20% off the job? Well, they did sign the contract. And Alison, your comment about co-production, co-design, I'd absolutely love you to come and have a look at some of the training plans and the complexities we have to put in place for audit requirements that our employers sign off. I can guarantee you every I and every dot has to, has to be crossed before we even enter into any kind of individual learning plan for, for employers. Um, but I think that we're at a position where, and a crossroads really for apprenticeships, where I think there is a bit of brand damage out there. I think there is uncertainty, both from those that are in work that have been asked to come onto apprenticeships to upskill to, dare I say, it, use levy and not look at a return of underspent levy from an employer's perspective. 
I think there is a disconnect now with what the original um, ambitions for apprenticeships that a lot of our employers have about taking younger people into their workforce to develop and train over time and allow for succession planning. And I think that just coming back to, to Michaela's point about those employers that disconnect completely, they, well, they're with me for four days a week and then one day they're on their apprenticeship. We hear that a lot, but it's because employers are busy. They have other things to do. They forget what they originally sign up for. And so that's my point around, I think they enter with the best intentions. I sometimes think that doesn't manifest itself just because of general business operational pressures. And I think that's going to get even worse with things like uh, cost of living crisis, inflationary pressures, et cetera. Um, so from my perspective, I think for the purposes of today, I think we go back to the basics of, in my view, an apprenticeship is first and foremost a job with, with skills and training development attached to it. And I think that the challenge is around our employers who I think in the vast majority of cases enter into the market with the best intentions but it just doesn't manifest itself through the complexities as and when they get their feet under the table and find out what this really means as they go through the programme. And I think that's sort of my little bit there. I'm happy to go on if, if anybody needs me to at this point. Thank you, James. I'm sure there'll be ample opportunities for people to, to explore it further with you in, 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 the, in the discussion. Um, that was very clear and concise. Thank you so much. And now um, we're going to ask Chris Tolley of the Powell Corporation to uh, to introduce her, her session. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, if there was a little bit of disruption at, at my end as we first started, my apology. I had a load of Christmas hampers being delivered into my office to distribute to my staff literally as this all kicked off, so it got a little bit hectic. Um, but I'm delighted to have been invited to join today's discussion and to share my thoughts. I'm gonna be coming very much obviously from the employer perspective, so which is in contrast to the other speakers. So I'm not gonna be quoting research or statistics or anything. This is about my own personal experience um, working with apprenticeships. Um, by way of some context about me and what my involvement's been, I've been an HR professional probably for more years than I care to remember. I've worked in a variety of sectors with the last 17, 20 years being in manufacturing, which I've found has been easily the most challenging to work in for, for lots of reasons. Um, I work here at Pol Aerospace. Uh, I'm, on, I'm based in Red Ruth in Cornwall. We manufacture filtration systems for aircraft, naval and, and military um, vehicles. And we're a very small part of the Danaher Corporation, which worldwide has 70,000 employees. A key challenge for us as a local employer is developing our talent pipeline, very similarly to probably every other employer, to maximise our resources and to retain the, aer the skills we need for the aerospace market because it's incredibly competitive and no more so than at the moment. Um, we have in this business a lot of long serving associates, um, some of whom have been here 30, 35 years which is quite unusual in this day and age. Um, and I'm anticipating as HR lead that in the next three, five years, that some of those are going to, a number of those are going to be heading out of the door as they elect to move into retirement or whatever. And that clearly is going to provide us with challenges in terms of succession planning and finding new talent. Thankfully, this business has a very, very well established, successful and fruitful engineering apprenticeship scheme. In fact, our current plant manager joined as an apprentice himself some 20 years ago and is now running the plant. This business has invested significantly in the scheme. We've got a huge apprenticeship workshop. We have dedicated supervisors and a large number of experienced associates who coach and mentor the apprentices and share their vast amount of experience with them. So, you know, what I would call actually almost a perfect apprenticeship scheme, and I know I'm flying our flag, but I think it deserves to be flown. Before I moved here, I worked in Birmingham in a, a Birmingham based business called Hydroforce Hydraulics, also a manufacturer, but very different type of product. Um, when I joined them about 17, 18 years ago, um, one of the first things I noticed was um, that it had a mature workforce, very similarly to PAL. Um, 
it had very because it it delivered it provided very niche products when we recruited we could not take engineers in and just assume they would hit the ground running there was lots of background work we had to do with them to get them to the school level where they could actually add, add value to the business again similarly to Powell, um, i looked at the demographic age groups we had in place and i knew that within the following 10 years we'd be losing a lot of experience both in the uk and the us um, the difference there was there was nothing in place to address that situation. So a key focus for me during my tenure was to develop the apprenticeship scheme, broaden its appeal to existing staff and the wider community in which we were located. And I, my aim was to attract new candidates, both male and female, given the challenges we've got, young and mature to join the company because I felt we offered them literally the chance of a lifetime. So what corporate PAL and privately owned Hydroforce have in common are the excellent apprentice schemes they offer. Both of them are focused on manufacturing and engineering because of the sectors that they're in. Um, and both of them are faced with a, a scarcity of skills and knowledge in their sectors. But equally, both of them are reaping the rewards of the investment they're putting into their uh, apprentice, apprenticeship scheme and they have put in over the last years. One thing that struck me in, in when I joined the, um, the manufacturing sector and throughout my career since, I've listened to seasoned engineers talk of the halcyon days, as they see it, of when they did their apprenticeships. Um, albeit, I think sometimes through rose tinted spectacles, I have to say. But what has always been evident to me when I have been talking to them is that they've got a very, very strongly, a shared, strongly held belief that their apprenticeships provided them with a firm foundation for their careers, both personally and professionally, because of the support they received while they were training. They've not, it's, they feel it's not only equipped them with engineering skills, but with a myriad of opportunities. And in my experience, Apprentice tra trained engineers see themselves as something extremely special and almost the creme de la creme in the engineering world. So that brings me to my definition of, of, of an apprentice. And I have to say, and this has already been touched on um, by Alison. Um, when I looked at the brief, um, I did take slight issue with the assumption that apprentices are novi both novice and employees and learners because in my view and experience, that is not necessarily the case. An apprentice may be a novice employee um, and an experienced employee may be novice in the area in which they're doing their apprenticeship, but they're not necessarily one and the same. And one of the very, very attractive aspects to me as an employer um, is that the apprentice proposition now opens it up to people of any age. And, and what really demonstrates that to me is I was at a, a, an awards ceremony about three weeks ago down here in Cornwall, and it was showcasing apprenticeship talent in the county. Um, and they had award winners from 17 years old all the way up through to somebody in their mid 50s. And to me, that is a, an absolutely fantastic um, opportunity and gift really we're giving to both employees and employers. So I'm a real passionate advocate of lifelong learning. And for me, apprenticeships in the 21st century play a real key part in that offering. I believe that any forward thinking employer does not simply focus on young people when they're looking at bringing people into the business for apprenticeships, but they'll open their schemes to the existing workforce and consider people of any age looking at the potential, not their, you know, their, their date of birth, if you will. To me, it's the appetite for learning and development that's important. So my very, very simple definition, and I am a very simple person of an apprentice, is someone who's hungry to learn, open to opportunity, so they can benefit from a, the support of a conscientious employer who's prepared to make a significant investment in them, both financially and professionally and personally. I've got very, very strong views based on my experience over the last 15, 20 years of how apprentices should be supported throughout their learning experience, because I think if they're not supported appropriately, they're almost being set up to fail. And when thinking about this brief, I decided to focus on my two principles in thinking about this um, and how effective apprenticeships can be built and delivered. But before thinking about how the apprentice can be supported, I think what is a really important facet is the critical aspect is finding the right individual to appoint as an apprentice. Um, I've interviewed more apprentices than I can even begin to think and I've worked with them. Some have been straight out of school, others have already been in work and want to develop. And regardless of the age or the field in which they'll work, there are some prerequisites for me when considering someone from an apprenticeship. 
The first is a keen, if not burning desire to learn. The applicants who come along to interview because their parents or their teachers told them to aren't the right ones for me and they switch me off immediately. It's the ones who want to be there and who bring along their projects or can talk to me with absolute passion about tinkering with engines or machines because after all we are an engineering business um, and have that passion to develop because they want to be like their mum or dad who's also an engineer and that's something that I don't think you can train into somebody it's either there or it isn't. Prospective employee uh, apprentices are, are the same to me as every other employee in many ways. And as an employer, it's much easier for me to motivate and support keen, engaged and enthusiastic employees. And to be able to build on that motivation and enthusiasm, the apprentice in turn needs the two pillars that I'm just going to come on to talk about. The first pillar has to be the employer. Now, I'm fortunate that the businesses I've worked in have operated apprenticeships, um, apprenticeship schemes, recognizing the really true long-term value to the business. And as I've said, I've been prepared to invest in their apprentices. I think like many of you, and it's sort of been touched on already, you know, I've heard the horror stories about apprentices who've been recruited ostensibly to be provided with skill development and career opportunity, might be also to use up the, the levy, but some employers see it as that opportunity they might not have thought of previously. But in reality, the apprentice ends up being cheap, used as cheap labour. They're not provided with a foundation and framework on which they can learn and build knowledge. To give some of those employers the benefit of the doubt, having been through this whole process of apprenticeship, they may be either economically stretched or simply naive and underestimate the demands and commitment they're making in taking on apprentices. And again, I think it's been touched on. They may not have the guidance and support that really is needed to provide the appropriate level of support to their apprentices. But said, so having said that, that's not really an excuse. They have a responsibility to those apprentices. Um, and sadly, in such situations, the outcome is really bleak for both parties. The business lose the opportunity of filling their pipeline, of getting somebody who's hungry and keen to learn and having some future talent to, to fill those key roles in the future particularly in an environment where competition is fierce for talent. And for the apprentices themselves, having joined a scheme full of aspirations to start or build on their career, they're likely to become at best disengaged and at worst, completely jaundiced by their experience in both the workplace and the apprenticeship scheme itself. A situation like that predicts a very dim outcome for their future. And as I keep saying, there's nothing worse than wasted talent. The second pillar of the um, is the training provider. And again, Michaela touched on this very much in, in, in her provocation. In my experience, the training provider is an absolutely critical support for both the apprentice and the employer. The value that a good training provider can add, it cannot be underestimated. I've experienced very different standards of providers, ranging from the not so good, but well-intentioned who didn't have appropriate resources to the ones who I felt were in it to make a fast buck. Thanks. Now that may sound very, very cynical, but unfortunately it proved true for me. Although I do have to caveat that comment by saying that when I'm making that comment, it's relating to my experience immediately post levy because I had new providers popping up from nowhere, banging on my door, promising to deliver the earth to me, and in, in reality, delivering very little or nothing. So, but on the other side of that, we've got what I would call the exemplars of, of learning and, and, and training. And they're the ones who've been keen to understand my business, understand my drivers for launching and operating an apprenticeship scheme, engage with me so I felt that I wasn't just a revenue stream for them, but a partner with whom they could work to develop, nurture and produce our future engineers and other professionals with, you know, for, to, to, to maintain the business. And I was looking for a partner who could help me in, initiate and sustain and nurture people who are enthusiastic, engaged and brimming with energy. I really cannot emphasise enough having used the not good at all to mediocre to excellent um, training provider, what a difference that makes to the employer and the apprentice. And I think that's never more so important than when the young people are entering the world of work for the first time. When I was working up in Birmingham, our level four engineering apprentices spent their first year at college on a full-time basis. So we recruited them in August, 
they went off in September and apart from our touch points and we had them frequently through that first year they didn't come back into the business until typically June July which meant to me that our college tutors were almost acting in loco parentis when the students were finding the coursework challenging they provided, provided additional support we held regular meetings with them to review progress and the college flagged up issues to us as their employer so we could work together as partners to overcome whatever challenges the student was faced with. I can share a really, really good example of this. It always stands out in my mind. Um, I was advised once that one of our apprentices was displaying some particularly challenging behaviours in class. The college had attempted to address it within the parameters of what they could do. And when that didn't produce the hoped for improvement, we worked together also bringing in the apprentice's parents in an effort to find a solution over a period of many, many months. To me, that was a college that really understood what it did, had a huge impact on the individual, not just educationally, but socially. It was a college who saw the apprentice as a young person with his own difficulties and challenges, who was embarking on a career with many years ahead and aimed to maximize his potential. That approach coupled with an employer who shared those values and was prepared to put in the extra effort and cost where we needed to, to develop and nurture the talent encapsulates the support and apprentice needs, regardless of where they are in their career. So in summary, a holistic approach and philosophy to supporting apprentices in my experience produces successful and therefore by default productive long-term employees who will repay the investment made in them through their con contribution to the business long after the apprenticeship has finished. And after all, as a business, we need to maximise the investment that we're making in our employees and our, our apprentices are no, no exception to that. So when the staffs of the apprentice, employer and educate and, and trainer provide a, a line, success is almost guaranteed for any apprentice who's prepared to put in the effort to achieve the accolade of apprentice train, a term my current and ex-colleagues use with great pride and satisfaction. So that's me. Thank you so much, Chris. That was an extremely concise and, and forthright contribution, which will, will inform our, our discussions as we go forward. We have about seven minutes left to the break. So there's time for a, a brief discussion. I wonder, Ollie, will you, will you regulate the, um, the, the flow of discussants? Of course, Chris. I, I wondered actually if we, um, those have been so helpful, but there's so much to digest. I wonder, Chris, if you just wanted to spend a couple of minutes reflecting some of the key messages you'd heard, and then we'll move into the breakout and give people just a, a bit of a chance to, to take a breath. Yeah, but by all means, yes, it's, um, it, it's hard to focus on any particular issues because the discussion has been so, so very rich and has come from such a variety of perspectives. But if, if I could just raise um, some points that, that struck me. Uh, the first one is conceptual and clarity about what an apprenticeship is. And, and we saw some fascinating points about that. I think, uh, I think Michaela in particular raised, raised the very disparate understandings that can be found amongst employers. And there's also the issue, I think, which we probably do need to return to about the relationship between apprenticeship for young people entering the world of work for the first time and those making a significant occupational transition. I think uh, needs there are probably similar, but in some ways quite importantly distinct. Um, the third point I thought was that was really interesting was this issue of demands made on employers. Uh, I've got some slightly mixed messages on that, but the impression I came away with was that the demands on employers are really significant. And when we take a, an organization like Power with enormous experience and probably quite resources in depth, um, and, and they tell us about what's needed to run apprenticeships successfully. Uh, one, one then needs to contrast that with novice employees, maybe smaller ones, and, and what the demands on them are going to be. So that, that was another very important point. And the final point I'd like to raise at this stage is about uh, the quality. We've, we've had comments about enormous variations in quality, both in the training organizations and, and among the employers and linked. I think that, that point is linked with and clarity about what apprenticeship is. And another point that I think was raised by both Alison and Michaela about the somewhat ambiguous attitude towards regulation that we have. And I think that's probably something we might want to revisit. 
So those are my initial thoughts, Ali. Really, really helpful. Such great inputs from everyone. Thank you. And really, as ever, cutting through to, to those key issues, Chris. So what I'm going to suggest we do, Will, I'm going to open the breakout rooms um, shortly um, because I want to make sure that everyone's got uh, enough kind of space and airtime in slightly smaller groups just to reflect on, on those. So you'll have kind of six or seven colleagues in your in your breakouts. Um, so I'll open those and I suggest that you just take a moment to introduce yourselves. I know we've got lots of old friends on the group and some new, so um, take a moment to introduce yourselves. Take five minutes away just to refill water, get a cup of tea, have a comfort break because there's a lot to digest. Um, and then we're going to be in those breakout rooms until about 25 past. Um, what I'd ask from each of those uh, breakouts is just to try and come up with two key questions or two key issues that you'd like to put back to the the, the um, discussants um, at the end. Um, and Prue is going to very ably chair that uh, that second half discussion when we come back and pick up some of those issues that you've um put together along with some of her own um, to put back to our uh, our panel and discuss a bit further. So yeah, I'll open the breakout rooms in a moment, do introductions, pop for a cup of tea, um, and then you've got until 25 past to, to discuss and uh, come up with a couple of areas you'd like to take further. Thanks, everyone. Hello, welcome back. Just waiting for everyone to land. In progress. Welcome back, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed your breakout sessions. Um, now we're back in the main room, just to remind people to mute, just in case uh, we get a little bit of feedback. Um, that would be wonderful. Perfect. Um, for this final part of the session, I'm really pleased to invite another one of our uh, stars of this uh, particular series, Prue Huddleston, to, to chair. Prue, do you want to just introduce yourself for people who haven't met you? I know you're uh, got lots of friends in the room and then um you might like to start by asking a couple of questions to the panelists and for others who are in the breakout groups please pop your your questions and topics in the chat for Prue to to pick from as well um, over to you Prue. okay thank you thank you very much uh, welcome back everybody um ollie can you also keep your eye on the chat at the I same time well do, because i'm trying to sort of spin all these plates at the same time. Hi, I'm Prue Huddleston, um, University of Warwick, um, I, and also a governor of a large college in Birmingham. And I taught in this sector for many, many years before working at the University of Warwick and all my uh, research areas are on vocational education, work-based learning, work-related learning. So hello, everybody. Um, we've had a very interesting discussion in our um, session and perhaps just to start the ball rolling with uh, questions to the panel before I ask other groups to come in with their questions. Um, I think uh, for me, uh, we were having quite a bit of discussion around assessment. Uh, and I don't particularly want to put Paul on the spot, but I'm going to anyway, um, because it's something we talked about, that the whole issue of how we assess this learning, particularly the workplace learning, uh, and what he's come up with there. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I want to hear what you said to us in the group, if I may. So if Paul would sort of um, just make his points, and then we can ask the panel perhaps what they feel about this. So Paul, would you be so kind as to just talk about the difficulties of assessment? Yeah, sure. And maybe talking about the, the most extreme uh, difficulty, I think, which is prompted uh, by a question from you, Pro, about the assessing uh, behaviours and, uh, you know, th the challenge of how you do that. And uh, we've moved from a system where uh, most of the assessment was ongoing, continuous throughout the apprenticeship um, to a system where it's all uh, focused around the, the end point. So by the time you've reached uh, competence, then the assessment kicks in and it's a fairly short assessment and that raises particular challenges um, for assessing behaviours. And I think there's a general agreement that um, uh, it was important to, uh, to specify uh, behaviours where they were critical to, to the, the role in question, but uh, extremely challenging to be able to assess them. And that's kind of exacerbated a, a, at the end of uh, an apprenticeship where you've only got a short time to do that, where many of the uh, behaviours that we're talking about are really dispositions. And by dis definition, dispositions is something you infer on the basis of a history of performance, the, you know, the tendencies, the traits, and how do you capture that within a, a snapshot endpoint assessment? It's kind of hard to know. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that was kind of the, the, the most extreme challenge uh, of the many challenges that we face in, in, in assessing apprenticeships. 
Thanks, Paul. I think I'm going to ask, um, Chris already responded to that. And I'd really like to hear James's uh, answer on that one, because obviously you're heavily involved in assessment, but the whole in the aspect of behaviours, and how, how you deal with that from a, a provider perspective. Right. It, uh, you know, you, it's not easy. Um, so that's, that's, that's the first short answer to this. I think um, from our perspective, it's about... we. We've maintained the original principles of um, the structure around almost frameworks to underpin the delivery of the standards. So what we've done is obviously through the process of regular contact reviews and just looking at that wise, wider personal development. So uh, we tend to uh, look at that behaviors piece. Um, not only obviously do we map the uh, training plan obviously alongside what's required from the standard, but then we add what we call the aspects of Warsaw College graduate, which is adding that underpinning element to the off the job piece. And it needs to be contextualized, dependent on whether that is a young person coming to us or whether that is an adult looking to reskill. What we found very early on is that you can't, you can't put in materials, reflective uh, elements of assessment for somebody that's been doing the job for 15 years within a particular occupational sector to that, to, compared to the individual that's just left school that, that maybe needs that more of an input around that that behaviour uh, and wider uh, skills development there. So ours is about still re re retaining that ongoing uh, assessment, formative assessment throughout the programme. And that's largely driven, though, not necessarily by the requirements of the endpoint assessment, but largely driven by us from that, that lens of Ofsted of what they are going to expect to see from our apprentices and challenge those apprentices to really be able to articulate that when they look at their their sort of wider understanding and benefits of the apprenticeship program. Thank you very much, James. I'm seeing that the questions are coming in thick and fast from groups, so I really ought to address those now. Um, we have a question here, I think it's is it Vicky? Sorry, it just says V. Uh, yes, sorry, Vicky, yes. Um, and she's saying there's been a lot of discussion about uh, employers and uh, a bit of a sort of rag bag really uh, there in terms of what's on offer. But um, she's saying, how do you allow the relationship between the employer uh, and, and the provider to flourish when there's so much noise from government bodies at the core, uh, which in a way might be sort of getting in the way of these really fruitful relationships. So thank you for the question. I think that's a really important question. Um, perhaps can we go first to Chris on that one? <coughs> Chris Tolly, <laughs> not Chris Wins, Chris. I think you're on mute, Chris. Thank you, Prue. Yeah. Um, I think really I'm going to come back um, really to what I said earlier, because to me, it's all about a partnership. Um, and it's it's about the sort of stages, if you like, of getting to know your um, the provider to understand that you're coming from the same, you have the same principles in place, you're looking for the same thing. Um, but, and, for example, if I, if I think when I when I chose my my provider, um, I did a, a beauty parade and I probably, you know, interviewed about nine or 10 different providers to to get that base understanding and then sort of move it on from there. And once I'd agreed with them and they'd agreed that they wanted to work with us because, you know, they might not have wanted to. It was about that dialogue between us and us understanding what we both needed to do and what our commitment was on both sides. And then when you've got the noise from the government bodies and everything else, quite frankly, I look to my provider to be able to, to help me navigate through that and where it was challenging for us. We worked, we worked together collaboratively. And I think, you know, that's not any different to any other relationship with any other supplier I've probably had. Um, it's just, you've got the added complication, if you will, or the added layer of the apprentice in there. But I think as long as the relationship works and you know what your, your sort of <coughs> expectations are on both sides, that's the way, um, that in my experience, we've worked through those. Thank you. Michaela, have you any thoughts on that from your research about how to nurture these relationships? Because you, you had a bit of a mixed picture. Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Um, 
Yes, and it is a very mixed picture. I don't think that's you know one size suits all, um, not at all. I mean, if if you want to call everything an an apprenticeship, so th there's of course the well established apprenticeships in the manufacturing, you know, in the traditional sectors, might have a very well long established relationship with, with with the provider. And there's yes, so if employers are new. Um, then it really depends. Um, so my, I would argue that uh, most employers want to use their apprenticeship and they have a particular rationale for, for, for wanting an, an, an apprenticeship. And there, there is a, they can work with a provider to, to fulfill the, that particular need um, because a lot of pro providers, in, in my experience anyway, Will will do everything in, in, in a way that supports the the employer. I think. Okay, thank you very much. We have a a, a question here from Chris's group. Um, your group raised the issue of a dilemma relating to the the, the uh, difference, if you like, the quality in terms of the niche provider, high quality and then the lowest common denominator mass product on the other. Um, and I think we had, we've had some examples today from our, our panelists clearly, and this, we suggest there was a great difference between a retail and health and social care where you as a mass product and some differences seem to occur. And I just wonder if Alison would like to comment on that in terms of these differences or perceived differences between high-end niche providers and um, you know, broader based offering. Um, so broader based offering in, for example, a lower level standard where there are a lot of starts. Yes, yes. I mean, I, th I think probably the first thing to say is that um, there'll always be kind of intra <laughs> intra unit uh, variation. So you'll have very good examples of provision which are perhaps at the lower end and, you know, kind of in, in that mass area as well as, you know, weaker. So I think that's, you know, something to be learned in terms of what, you know, what are the drivers of the good practice? And I think that that's where the, you know, the capacity often comes in is what the kind of capacity is. And certainly work we've done on the, um, the health sector, there, of, there often is good capacity, you know, in the NHS, for example, to support um, workforce development, you know, more broadly. Um, so you get some very, very good practice, um, even, for example, in, you know, healthcare assistance at level two, um, as well as at, at level three, um, because, you know, because that capacity, you know, because that capacity is there. I think the, the other aspect is also to do with what's, what's the purpose of it, um, which will, will fit, you know, will feed in, you know, if, if the purpose is linked to uh, something indirect, like, you know, spending our levy, um, then that you know that might mean there's less of a laser focus on on quality. If the focus is you know as you know in the examples that Chris Tolley's told us about you know that it's you know absolutely critical to business success and sustainability, um, linked to a sector where there's a you know a significant amount to be learned, then you're going to get you know a very different sort of set of um, outcomes in terms of in terms of quality. One of the interesting things I think is. You know, it, when we're looking at the withdrawal issue, which is, I think, you know, very much preoccupying um, the department at the moment, as, as well as many of us, you know, even even in areas which generally, as a generalisation, tend to have a, a higher ceiling around quality, you're seeing high high withdrawals. And one of the things that we talked about quite a bit in our group was the issue of endpoint assessment. And the way that that's you know kind of distorting and there's some distortions there and a kind of lack of clarity about what the purpose of endpoint assessment is in particularly in in, in some sectors and some standards um and the kind of um perverse things going on whereby the key points of the standard have been met particularly in terms of you know kind of registering professional bodies and that kind of thing um and there being a lack of clarity about what the point is for endpoint assessment um, so kind of dropping out before then. So that's kind of where we started to, to go with that. But I think the bigger point is, you know, what's the purpose of it? You know, what is the, you know, why is this apprenticeship? And then generally apprenticeship's just got to be such a big umbrella um, that there's so much scope now for sort of slippage, um, you know, in, in multiple directions. 
conflict, but that's where we start start to see some of this, you know, kind of worrying practice. Yeah. Thank you. I see Michaela has her hand up. Is it in answer to that question? Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. No, I wanted to add to what Alice yes. said as well, because it does come down to how do we define apprenticeship and do we want do we want everybody to to provide expansive um, apprenticeships? And that's clearly not the way forward um, because we just would have fewer apprenticeships. That's my point. But um, I also think that some employers may just or some occupations may not be um, may may not lend themselves to being trained by our apprenticeship. So, for example, what we found in social care is that um, th there was no on-the-job training or very little in on-the-job training, partly because it wasn't seen as ethical uh, that that people would get training around vulnerable um, individuals. So they had to let, to leave everything to off the job and then ask questions about it. Um, so you know, and and then, so it was a lot of um, what's it called front loading with with social care. So it it, it was in no way did that resemble a, 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 a an apprenticeship. But it, for me, it, it comes down to how do we define an apprenticeship and do we call this everything an apprenticeship or should certain types of training be called something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Michaela. I think Martin had a hand up. Is that right? Oh, it's just really points that me picked up. I think Prue. It was the point to, to Alison's. It's actually it's almost an inverse relationship here. If you have an ex, if you have a market of expansive apprenticeships only, you have a restricted market. And if you have a market of restrictive apprenticeships, you end up having a much more expanded apprenticeship market. It's the inverse relationship the point you're making and I, I just reflected a little bit also Prue just subsequently on, on my experience in the Air Force is where we did have apprenticeships in all the traditional fields for a very long time in the aircraft on aircraft which would be a look to your point about the point of this that the need for an apprenticeship was clear when the opportunity came we expanded it into other areas of military business reasonably successful but that was in to Chris's point around an organization which had a an embedded learning philosophy and would see every member of the, the force as someone you were looking to develop. So you could expand your apprenticeship provision in a good way. You've had an organization which was just philosophically attached to that. And I can't see how in the SME market, in the in, in every sector of the economy, you could you could afford to have or would have expansive employment apprenticeships so to Michaela's point I think we do need to call it something else the brand has almost been stretched to breaking point and it can't be stretched any further yes thank you Martin it's a highly relevant point and I think uh, our panelists mentioned the damage that had been done to the brand by using it almost as a catch-all <laughs> term for something which we wouldn't really recognise as an apprenticeship. I, I once, once sent to the skills minister, it seems to be the answer is an apprenticeship. Now tell me what the question was. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Uh, there's a question from Teresa here, and I think this is probably directed to James, um, or I'll ask James to respond first, if I may. Um, it's saying it may be easier for a provider to, to, to sell an apprenticeship to an employer with a good track record and is known, well known. But then it, the question asks, how do you approach a relatively new uh, prospective employer uh, who's not had this background, it's hard to achieve because, uh, as Teresa says, you're trying to sell the biggest and most complex training product as the first offer. Um, <laughs> you want to go with something a little less complex to start with. Anyway, James, from a college perspective, how do you do that? Um, so, so I, I mean, Teresa, Teresa knows, obviously, that you know it is easier for those more established sectors that have been heavily involved, like, like Chris and, and engineering, construction, uh, tend to have had that sort of um, support, and they've got that ethos of apprenticeship running through them. It's, it's, you know, it's a bit like M M Martin's commentary around, you know, it, it's embedded into sort of the ethos and that whole sort of workforce planning scheme of that, of that employer, where we tend to take um, or engage with new employers I, I, how do I put it? We, we tend to try and put them off in the first instance 
because that's the only way that we get to my point earlier on around we need to ensure we need to ensure as a provider that they that employer understands their level of commitment we're very much and coming back down to one of the other questions is we very much pride ourselves on trying to hide hide the government wiring for those employers but they need to understand that they are in this for the long term we see this as a fundamental uh, partnership that lasts for a number of years well obviously it's 12 months and a day as a minimum and now we stand as obviously that tends to be more 13 14 15 months as a minimum but you know the vast majority of programs particularly when we look at more uh, things like electrotechnical four or five years we are in bed with each other effectively working together as embedded into that organization for that period of time so we very much lay out the through various um organizational needs analysis at the very beginning of, of what this means to that employer and give them an opportunity to reflect on their own resource what this means what the 20 percent off the job means we even can do some cost analysis on what that means as far as downing sort of tools for that 20 percent job over the period of time so they know that lack of productivity for potentially that time that we've got the theory based or that off the job input Okay, thank you. Any other of our panelists would like to comment on that point? I just wanted to ask something to James. Okay. Yes, this is Michaela to James. <laughs> uh, James, uh, yeah, thanks for that. So, so I was interested in, you know, with new employers then, would you kind of uh, try and encourage uh, a certain type of provider employer relationship do you have particular expectations of the employer in terms of workplace training um so for example the you know what would be part of a quality apprenticeship for me would be to have somebody who mentors the the, the apprentice yeah. on, on a regular basis on a daily basis really yeah ab absolutely so we um we, without sort of going into the nuances of the whole sort of uh, employer and, and learn learner journey. Um, it, it starts off for us. The, the key bit coming back to to the design, the design, the co-design of the program, the ability to get that that training plan acutely sequenced to what that apprentice is going to go through is absolutely critical, and that that employer signs that off. We do encourage that they have uh, a workplace mentor. Um, sometimes, again, with the best will in the world. Um, employers, both small and large, go into this with all gusto and enthusiasm. Yes, we've got mentors. Yes, line managers will be available to sign off every single review, every single sort of element of commentary or input. That doesn't necessarily uh, happen, happen all the time. But all of those bits and pieces we try to put in front. We have an account management strategy as well for our larger employers. So obviously they will have a specifically aligned uh, third party outside of the trainers and lecturers that are assigned to them that will do regular reviews. My biggest book bear, and I've got to put it in there, we don't get paid um, as providers for all of this extra work that we put in. Um, it, it's not part of the calculations that's put in place when the, uh, the funding band is assigned to the standard. We do it as part of just our customer service offer to that employer. And I think it's largely what the, the experience and the service that Chris was describing earlier from the good providers that she's got working with her. She's pro she probably have all of the things hopefully that I've talked about on a regular basis and that's why that partnership works because you're in it for the long term mm. thanks thank you James Alison no, thanks so it's just to really put into a slightly different um perhaps way of, of thinking about some of this is we've talked a lot about the kind of provider employer relationship it's almost like a one-to-one -one type uh affair and you know clearly that's um you know potentially a very expensive and time consuming in terms of getting those optimum relationships in in other other countries there's a, a tradition of more collective arrangements mm. um around uh you know employers in the same sector potentially in the same region coming together um and understanding that the they're collectively responsible for training um uh, the occupation expertise um and that uh, you know that it kind of deals with the, with the free rider problem but also that there's a kind of collective responsibility to the occupation um that can be dealt with um you know better in a more more efficiently through a kind of collective a collective approach 
Um, and, you know, in this country, we have the group training associations, which are, you know, one, you know, I think, you know, quite significant um, type of organisation that tries to do some of that. But it, it may be that the, there's the scope to, you know, revisit some of those, you know, questions because the, the impetus and direction of policy and funding has been very transact, you know, to encourage the transactional and the kind of one on one. Um, whereas in many of these areas, the kind of um, requirement and the, the impetus to sort of train actually is a share, you know, it's a shared challenge. Um, uh, so maybe that's something that we might want to, to kind of revisit, um, uh, you know, partly to deal with the efficiency issue and, and partly to deal with the skill shortages and, you know, kind of productivity uh, issues which go beyond the, the individual organisation. Mm. Yes, I, I think that's, uh, that's very helpful, Alison. And uh, I was very struck by the way in which Chris alluded to the high status accorded to engineering apprentices and apprenticeships, and that your plant manager had come through the route and it carries with it a, a badge of excellence. We belong to this professional yeah. community and is highly recognized. Mm -hmm. And I think Alison's right in the sense that we don't have that everywhere. Uh, but we have it in some areas. It's like if you were trained at a particular college uh, can carry huge status in particular sectors. Uh, so it's developing the, the identity really and, and what this means, which doesn't exist everywhere. So thank you very much for that. We're um, nearly at the, yes, sorry. Alison, could I just make a couple of comments on what's been said? And one's a sort of bit, a bit off piste really, but one, uh, one of the biggest challenges I think to employers is that, that dedicated 20% off the job training, um, not necessarily in terms of the time being able to be given over to that apprentice, but actually very often, and I'm talking about, you know, other colleagues I've spoken to, understanding how they can, that can be delivered. Um, and that is a real challenge, I think. And I do think that is something that in many cases will switch businesses off, for want of a better phrase, in terms of thinking about an apprenticeship and how it might work. That's one element. And then another thing, one thing that strikes me here, I'm talking about the relationship as James did between the, the uh, training provider and the business. But in a way, I only look at it in exactly the same way as um, any business in my view would be looking at any of their suppliers. So if I've got a supplier, whether I'm a, you know, a large or a, a smaller business, if I've got a key supplier, I would be looking to have a relationship with that person. I would be looking to have account reviews with that with that supplier. I would be looking to address issues that might come up. So if purely business head, forget education and stuff, if you look at it in that perspective, we're, you know, businesses are not looking to treat training providers or deal with or interact with training providers in any in any different type of way. And sometimes in in you know in my experience has been that training providers have been quite surprised when I've wanted to develop that relationship. It's as if they've sort of thought, well hang on a minute, I'm delivering training for your people. Well, you don't need to do that with me. And that can be a really big turn off for some businesses, I think. Thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you to everybody. Uh, there are many unanswered questions, uh, but our time is running out. Uh, and uh, I thank everybody for the contributions. But before we hand over to Chris, Teresa, thank you so much for your comment, uh, uh, where you were saying, I hope what we all believe and we're in this game for, that we've had a lot of discussion about relationships between employers and providers can be very easy to forget that there is a learner, novice or otherwise, in the mix also. And I would hope that we all have learners at the heart of what we're trying to do, to have an excellent outcome for the learners as well, that they have a positive experience and they can develop through this. So Teresa, many thanks for that. It's a wonderful closing <laughs> remark. Uh, and thank you everybody for your contributions. Sorry not to get round all the questions. Chris, I think it's over to you now. Thank you, Pro. Um, Ollie's asked me to try and summarise the discussion. Always an impossible job, and thus will be done imperfectly. But what I can do is give you some of my instant reactions to the themes that I think have been emerging in the course of this discussion. So here goes. Um, I return, first of all, to this issue, this terminological conceptual issue of conceptual inflation 
of the term apprenticeship and the accompanying and clarity about what it means. I think it's fair to say that's been a pretty pervasive theme throughout this discussions. And I think we could break it down into three further sub themes worthy of uh, further consideration. First of all, this issue of the di dilemma, if you like, uh, or the inverse relationship as Martin put it. Are you going for a high quality niche product or a lowest common denominator mass product? Or is there some kind of uh, via media which, uh, which is more satisfactory? Again, that's, that's something unresolved. I think there's, there's the issue of two very distinct but very important aims uh, which go under the umbrella of apprenticeship. First of all, um, young people's transition into adulthood and more specifically into the world of work on the one hand, very important, I think, but also um, occupational change, which is a significant milestone in any, any adult's life. And I think that the, the needs of the individuals and the demands placed on providers and firms are somewhat different in each case. And then finally, a point was raised about the different needs of different sectors. How many sectors really need full-blooded apprenticeship? Um, I know we've had a long history in this country of trying to expand apprenticeship going from the 1964 Industrial Training Act onwards, with, I have to say, very limited success on the whole. Do we, do we want to revisit that issue? Now that's a, a that issue of conceptual um, conceptual inflation is a large one, but it, it's also related to questions about quality and regulation. I think because decisions made about what counts as apprenticeship or what kind of a, apprenticeship you have impact pretty directly on what you regard as fit for purpose and uh, the rigor with which you're prepared to to regulate the provision. So those issues, those more practical issues, are quite closely related to this definitional one. The, the other major theme that I, I thought came through was the issue of employers, uh, how capable and how willing are they to indulge in apprenticeship? And again, you've got the huge variety of employers, both in terms of capacity and experience. Um, do we want to expand the employer base? Um, do we want to promote more collective arrangements as, as Alison intimated? And if so, how do we go about that? Um, what sort of resources do we want to put in to um, employers and employers working with providers in terms of um, assisting employers, educating employers to become more willing and more competent at taking on apprenticeship? I suspect that's quite a resource hungry issue, but it, it maybe is one that we, we need to consider. And the final point I wanted to raise was um, about information. And that breaks down into an elephant, which we haven't really given a prod, which is information and, and guidance for young people. Uh, one of our, our group raised the question of just what a challenge it is for a young person trying to navigate their way through the, the the jungle of, of different kinds of apprenticeship offers. But I, I think it's it's also a, a problem for employers as well, particularly employers who are not experienced in, in offering apprenticeships. Um, if there is a market which is a bit too much like the Wild West, um, employers as well as young people are likely to get hurt. And that, that raises the question about how how rigorous we ought to be about regulating this, this particular market. Um, those were the main points that I've got. I'm sure there are many others that um, are going through people's minds at the moment, but uh, I think the ones I've raised are, are worthy of, of further consideration in the future, maybe. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Chris. You always say it's going to be really hard to summarise and then you do such a brilliant job of it. So uh, I'm going to keep asking you to, to do that. Um, just to, to make sure that we close on time, I just wanted to say some thank yous. So huge thanks to Chris W and to Prue for chairing so well. And, and massive thanks to Alison, Michaela, James and Chris for your brilliant inputs as well. And thanks everyone for your contributions to the discussion. We're going to write up a, a short article about this and share the, the video as well so that we can get even more people kind of engaged in this conversation. Um, there are two more sessions in this series. Uh, many of you are coming to some of those, but if you uh, haven't yet signed up, but you'd like to just drop me an email and I'll, I'll add you to those. But yes, huge thanks for that excellent conversation. Uh, really enjoy the rest of your afternoons and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, everyone.
Cheers, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.